Thank you very much, John. I really appreciate it. Appreciate all you folks coming out tonight um, to, to hear about a huge event from 85, 85 years ago. Um, the, uh, the hurricane of, of 1938 arrived um, totally unexpected. The, the uh, Boston Globe the following day had a lead story saying a tropical hurricane of incredible violence swept Massachusetts and the rest of New England last night for the first time in the history of the area. Now, isn't that phenomenal that in 1938, they could think that that was the first time that this had ever happened? <laughs> We've seen so many of them since 38, right? But in fact, the, the previous one to 1938 was 1879. And so people just were not used to this. This was, this was brand new. And, and it came totally unannounced and, um, and it was shocking, devastating. Only, only three times in recorded history has a hurricane um, hit interior New England. Many, many have affected the coastline, but only three have affected interior New England. 1635, just right after settlement, um, 1815 and then 1938 and you'll see that there's something that they have in common and that is that they're all coming up over the ocean and they have not made landfall yet the first time they make landfall is in in the two cases uh, in Long Island and then crossing the sound and then the other one hit Rhode Island first so in order for a hurricane to maintain that kind of power, it has to have, have the, the warm water of the ocean to, to feed it. So it's a, tropical, it's a tropical cyclone, depends on warm ocean temperature to fuel it. Once it hits, makes landfall, it slows down. So the, this is the track of the 38 hurricane. The circles on there are 12, 12-hour uh, intervals, and so you'll see that it started off the coast of Africa, headed toward Florida, and people in Florida were very, very worried about this storm because two years prior that it, there had been a deadly storm that um, had killed a lot of people in Key West, and so the forecasters um, hadn't done a good job on the one in 36, and they didn't want to blow this one. And so they really played this up as a really big, powerful storm. Consequently, all of the ships at sea who normally radio in their information to the hurricane, uh, to the weather service, telling them, well, I'm at such and such the latitude and longitude. Um, we've got winds from the southeast at 40 knots. Those are the things that tell that, that they put together to figure out where a storm is. That was back in the day. We have a lot of different technology today. But back then, they relied entirely on ships to radio in. But they scared the, the, uh, the people, the ship captains, so badly that nobody was out there reporting on it. And so when it turned to the north, they all breathed a sigh of relief, and they assumed that it was gonna follow this red track, which is a very, very standard track for hurricanes. And the reason that it, for that is, there, there's a couple reasons. One, out over the, the Atlantic, there is a, almost a stationary high pressure system called the Bermuda High. And it's, it sits out there and, and hurricanes cannot work their way into a big dome of high pressure like that. They skirt it. You would think a hurricane is so powerful. Well, it is. It's very, very powerful, but it's steered by the prevailing winds and by the prevailing systems. And so they assume, and, and most hurricanes do, um, they curve, they recurve once they get out past the Bermuda High because they've got winds coming off the, off the continent 
we have prevailing westerly winds that come through, sweep across the, the continent, and basically blow hurricanes back out into the ocean. But this time, it, it didn't, because there was the, the Bermuda High was stationed much farther north than anybody knew. And so it was, it was way up um, adjacent to New England. And so instead of following the path out to sea, it barreled right on through, right into New England. And so looking again at the 12-hour intervals, those circles, um, you see that it, it sort of poked along um, as it headed west. But once it turned north, it was like it was a catapult. It just got flung to the north really, really fast. And so it was coming at 50 miles an hour. Um, and so storms normally don't travel that fast. This most recent one, Lee, was poking along at 10, 12, 14 miles an hour and staying, you know, staying long enough to soak places but not to, not to um, hit any place with, with severe wind. Um, to move at 50 miles an hour is almost unprecedented. And so the, it was called in the, in the days after, it was referred to as the Long Island Express. So it hit Long Island and it hit Long Island like an express train, 50 miles an hour. And consequently, it came and went in, uh, over the period of about five hours. So all the damage from that hurricane, which you're gonna see a lot of, and, uh, happened in, in, in just five hours. Just a very, very fast moving storm. So one of the huge consequences and familiar to all people um, who grew up in Rhode Island or, or who live here now um, was the storm surge. The storm surge was um, uh, just, a, a, a huge, huge wave um, coinciding with a high tide at the, at the equinox, just, uh, a, just a great confluence to make it a very, very substantial surge. And it, it hit the coast of Long Island, crossed Sound, and then hit Rhode Island, and, and it just swept entire houses, an entire beach community out to sea. It was um, just a, a, a terrifying event, and nobody had a clue that it was coming. There was no advance warning. So there was also inland flooding from it. So um, this is uh, in central Massachusetts. I think this is the town of Weir. And you watch that building on the right. And so. It, it came down in it, and it, it was just, um, the flooding was, um, now you won't believe that there could have been a rainier summer than this, but there was. 1938 was very much like this summer. Very, very rainy, saturated ground. Any new rain that came had nowhere to go. So, and then another really fascinating thing about this hurricane, New England was already flooded when the hurricane arrived, an entirely different system. But Massachusetts and New Hampshire in particular were already flooded. So the, the, um, the rivers were swollen and then entirely different system, this hurricane came. And with it came 100 mile an hour winds. Those 100 mile an hour winds took down trees, houses, power lines, they took down, um, these, are, these are all elm trees um, along one of uh, a Massachusetts street, um, more, more trees down. Here's a steeple from a church in Monson, Mass. Um, and then the next one, this is a steeple as well. This steeple is inside the church. So if you notice down on the left-hand side, there's two people standing there. So that, that steeple worked its way up into the air and down like a javelin into that church. That week was the week of the Eastern States Exposition, the Big E. 
So the biggest fair in New England was going on at the time of the 1938 hurricane. And you can see the Ferris wheels in the background, um, just tremendous damage. But again, the whole notion of, of New England being underwater already, I mean, they were basically telling people to leave on the morning of the hurricane before it hit without even knowing that there was a hurricane coming. The hurricane arrived in the afternoon, late, late afternoon. Um, so closer to home, I have some photos um, of houses in Providence. Um, these were um, given to me by a friend of mine. One of these houses was, was hers. Um, and then Westerly. So a lot of these photos I've gotten from newspapers at the time. So they're, news, they're newspaper photos. Um, I, I hope that the quality holds up enough so that, so that you, can, you can see them. But the, so this combination of storm surge, flood, and, and 100 mile an hour winds um, was absolutely devastating. So the evening bulletin, um, uh, this was I believe the, the September 23rd. Um, so this is a preliminary account of, of the death toll, um, but just to give you an idea of, of what, was, what the news was reporting at, the, at that time. Here's some more local, local damage, local houses, see power poles down. So there was no, no communication. You couldn't drive anywhere. You were stuck at home um, trying to dig out. And you didn't know whether your relatives were safe. And it's a tremendously frightening time. Now, I believe I saw this photo also out on the, the table there. Um, does, can somebody tell me what that, what that, does anybody recognize where that is? The, I, I, I don't, I don't, it, it's not a trick question, I don't know. <laughs> um, so then a, a day later, the storm, the toll was now 240. Notice the, the other headline, checks prepare for war. So this is right at the time that Hitler is invading um, uh, the, the Czechoslovakia. And um, so it's 1938, a lot going on in September. So the, the 38 hurricane even had a movie star uh, attached to it. So this is Catherine Hepburn sitting in, in what's left of her bathroom in Old Saybrook, Connecticut. So when I started working on my research on the, on the hurricane, everything that I read had been written about, about the, the damage down here to the coast and all the, the death and the destruction. And, and it was um, just awe-inspiring. More than 600 people died and more than 400 people, uh, uh, more than 400 of those were in Rhode Island. So it was, it was a, a, just a, a terrible loss of human life, a terrible tragedy. Um, but it had been very, very well covered. Um, there's a number of books on it. Um, Sudden Sea um, by R.A. Scotty is, to my mind, the best of the ones that cover the personal, um, personal stories. I was interested in this because it not only did that kind of destruction destroy human life, human infrastructure, but it also destroyed the forests. And the forest is my background, my beat. And so this fellow here is Fred Hunt, and he was a 14-year-old boy in Ringe, New Hampshire, when the hurricane hit. And, he, and I wanted to tell his story. And he was out in the, in the, um, the morning of the hurricane. He was out playing hooky because the neighboring town was flooded and he'd never seen a, a village flooded. So he wanted to go see it. 
And so he went and he um, walked around uh, southern New Hampshire and into northern Massachusetts about 20 miles that day. And by mid-afternoon, um, he noticed that the wind was coming up. And he was out and in, in a long ways from home. And a tree fell right behind him. A big, big pine tree fell behind him. And so he had the presence of mind uh, as a 12-year-old boy to get under that tree while the rest of the forest blew down all around him. So everything, everything in sight blew down while he was sitting under that tree. This gives you a, a, a picture of, of what, what happened around, around Fred Hunt that day. So 600,000 acres throughout New England. So this, this, um, this storm made it all the way into New Hampshire and Vermont with 100 mile an hour winds. And it could only do that because of the forward speed of 50 miles an hour. It just did not lose its strength. So 2.6 billion board feet. Here's a way for you to at least get a glimmer of what that is. So you've got these, a truckload of that size. It would take 430,000 of those trucks to, to convey all of the wood that came down in that day. Convoy from Boston to Seattle and back. Just tremendous, um, just a mind-boggling amount of wood on the ground. We know that because foresters went out and they inver inventory. And so they all went out to, and, and just reported on the damage in their districts. Notice the foresters of the time wore fedoras, which I really get quite a kick out of. Um, and it's not an affectation, that's what they did. Here's another one. So these are, these are uprooted trees. So most of the trees uprooted. You see back, I'll just swing back. See, there's a few that snapped off and a few that were left standing, but most of them uprooted. So this, this map shows the, um, the extent of the damage to the forest. Um, and you'll see that the, the reddish tone is, uh, marks a town that had more than 10 million board feet down. So that was the highest level of damage. And so you'll see that there's five towns in Rhode Island, all of them right up on the mass border. Um, Boroughville, North Smithfield, Woonsocket, Cumberland, and Lincoln, all of which had 10 million in damage. That was partly because they had more trees up there to come down. And I'll talk about that in more later. Seven towns had medium damage, including one, you know, where we are right now, and neighboring towns, Westerly, Charlestown, South Kingstown, Exeter, Foster, Gloucester, and Smithfield. So a lot of damage in those, in those towns. One of the things that was really fascinating to me, and which I needed to do the research on, was that that it wasn't just one big swath of trees down from the, from the sound up to the Canadian border. They were um, in patches. So there'd be five acres blown down here, one acre there. The largest was a 90 acre blow, and that's, that's really substantial. But most of them were, were small, sort of like the, so those trees that you see there, the three in a row, um, that was a, just a regular, garden variety windstorm that happened in my woods in central Vermont about 20 years ago. I shot that photo um, and, and, and after the storm. And basically, this, this was maybe a quarter acre was affected by, by these trees knocking other trees down. So there was a lot of, a lot of that sort of thing. The big reason for well, well, so if you're to try to determine whether you were, your, your place was vulnerable to the hurricane of 38, you would have to have been to the right-hand side of the, 
of the storm track. And that's because a, a, a hurricane is a, is a cyclone. It, it, its winds are, are um, counterclockwise. And so on the right-hand side of the storm, you're getting wind that is being compounded by the forward motion. And so you've got a 50 mile an hour forward motion compounding, say, say it's a 50 mile an hour rotation. So you've got 50 mile an hour winds. On the right hand side, those are coming from the south and they're, and, and they're being compounded. So you've got 100 mile an hour winds on the, on the east side of the track. And on the west side, it basically canceled itself out. And on the west side, it was mostly a, a rain event. So they got a lot of rain, but they didn't get much wind. So the southeast wind was the most, um, was the strongest and the most devastating. Down here, the, the hurricane still very much had its tight, compact, circular eye and, and, and formation. And, and once it hit land, then it kind of spread out and became what's called an extra tropical um, uh, system. But here, it was still very, very much a tightly focused um, uh, category two hurricane. So then you get more local and you say, okay, well, what about my land? Well, if your land faced the south or faced the east, then, um, then you were more likely than if you were on the north side of a hill or the west side of the hill where you'd be in the lee of the storm. And it made a significant difference. Um, we know that, that Rhode Island is not known for its mountains. In fact, I know that 802 is the highest elevation in the state. But, um, but still, there, are, there is topography and there's hills. And so the front side, the south side, the east, south and east facing slopes of hills would have been more vulnerable um, to, to hurricanes. This is my land up in Vermont. Um, at, at the top, um, and the top of that hill is 1,600 feet, and down in the valley is 1,000 feet. So that's a six, 600 foot climb there. So it was very, very vulnerable, and that's facing south, and then, and then the one on the, so those two ridges there are facing south and east. So, the, so, so my land blew down in the 1938 hurricane. We bought our land in 1988, and it had what I thought was a, you know, beautiful, mature forest. And um, and I was shocked to learn that it had blown down in the 38 hurricane, which is really why I started doing the research on this book. So another reason um, why your land might have blown down was whether or not it had trees on it. So the the um, history of agriculture in New England started right at settlement. So much land was cleared, just a tremendous amount of land cleared, and thus, um, you know, all, all used for agriculture. This graph shows um, the, the six New England states and the amount of forest cover from settlement um, up until 1910. So this is um, this was a paper that was written in 1912, but you, you just play those lines out and see basically agriculture um, was kind of, um, uh, people were finding better land out west, people were finding other kinds of work, and so right, right in, in here in the 1850, we started to lose farms. And farms, what happens when you stop farming is trees grow back. And pine is a, a tremendous um, seed, seed tree. It, it can um, easily take over a field in, in a very, very short time. So once you stop grazing it, once you stop haying it, the trees come in. And so that was happening all over, all over New England. And so, um, in, in parts of Rhode Island, um, uh, at the time we think Rhode Island was about 50% forest at, at that time. And right now it's 56% it's forest. So there's a lot of trees out there. Um, 
And the taller the tree, the better, the better the lever, the more damage is possible. So white pine grows really tall, really fast. And so those, those white pine stands were, were vulnerable um, at, at an age of 30 years. So with all of this timber on the ground, the Forest Service was very, very worried that there would be another disaster on top of this one. And so they got the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, and the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, out cleaning up the mess. And so basically what they did was they, they took the tops of trees, piled them up, and then on a rainy day or when there was snow cover, they burned it so that they could the preemptive burns. And so you see these trees are just stripped. More guys working. And you'll note that their, their saws don't make any noise. They're not chainsaws. There was no such thing as a chainsaw until 1948. So all this work being done, clearing up this tremendous blowdown, was done with hand tools. So what they were trying to do was reduce the, the, the threat of fire. And so along roadsides, um, near houses, they're just trying to get rid of as much brush as they possibly could. So 16,000 WPA men. So the WPA was a, a, a federal agency, a make work agency. This was the New Deal, mind you. So we're talking the, the tail end of the depression. Um, and so people needed work. And so the WPA um, would, if a family needed relief, they would hire one, one person from each family. And it was administered at the county level. And so, um, so 16,000 men were called into service on cleaning up. And then the CCC were, were young kids, were 18 to 22 year old young men and they were um, uh, considerably more um, vigorous in their efforts than the WPA guys. Um, but combined, they rebuilt 15 fire towers, cleared uh, 215,000 acres. I mean, that's a lot of land. Um, and um, expended almost five million man days to do this, to do this work. So that's the fire side of it. And then, but there's all these logs. So you've got all of these logs down. Anybody who owned land and was depending on, on the income from these trees, um, th they were on the ground. And because it was such a glut of, of wood, who would pay anything for it? The market force, the market was totally destroyed. Um, you know, you, you'd be more likely to pay someone to come and get rid of it. And so in, in an amazing um, uh, feat of, of government um, um, activity, uh, government um, ingenuity, they created the Northeast Timber Salvage Administration within a month. And it wrote its first check to a landowner a month after the hurricane. I mean, imagine that today. I mean, you know, we can't. We can't get anything done, and these guys, these guys got, it was, it was, so basically what they did is they set up a program that would buy logs. If you could get them delivered, they would buy the logs, and so, um, and they, they figured out what the, the, the market price was um, prior to the storm so that people didn't feel like they were, um, were not getting a fair deal. Um, so they bought lot, lots and lots of, of logs. So in Rhode Island, there were 54 storage sites. So there's 54 places that you could, you could deliver logs. Um, the three largest, one was in uh, West, West Greenwich, another in Exeter, and another in Gloucester. Um, 11.6 11, uh, 11 million board feet were, um, were salvaged, were bought by the, by the government. 10 of the sites were in Exeter, nine in Coventry, and six in West, West Grand. Um, so there was a lot of this activity going on 
um, all of this um, away um, from the disaster that was happening on, on the coast. If there is at all a silver lining to the cloud of the 38 hurricane, it said it put people back to work. So there was all sorts of work for, for anybody who was looking for work um, in the cleanup and in the rebuilding. Here's a logging crew with the highest technology of the day, a crawler tractor with a scoop, all these guys with PVs. Um, that's a lot of guys working, and they hadn't been working before. The wood was brought to sawmills, portable sawmills, and so in today, sawmills are set up and you bring the wood to the sawmill. In those days, you brought the sawmill to the wood. And so those various sites, that, the 50 some odd sites in Rhode Island, a portable mill would come there to saw that, saw that wood. It, that, this, this was a, a, a mill near Harvard Forest. And then this next one is um, in, uh, in near Concord, uh, New Hampshire, Bosque. So I'm going to take a little shift and talk about the signs, the visible signs of hurricane damage that lingers today. And, and if the woods were blown down in 38, you'll see this. And so the first thing to see is this, so that's me standing in a pit that was created by a tree going over in the, in the 38 hurricane. So the way it works is you've got what's called pit and mound topography. Um, a tree blows over, it pulls up all the root system, and, it, and by doing so, it rips a hole in the ground. And then over time, it deposits that, that um, all of the, the soil, the rocks, and everything in a mound. And so, going back a slide, so you see that pit and that mound um, created by the hurricane. Now that happens any time that a tree blows down, but you could tell that it was from the 38 hurricane if you have a preponderance of them all going in the same direction. And so you can tell what direction the tree fell down by you stand in the pit and you look out over the mound and you see that the tree fell in that direction because the, the mound is, is in front of you. Um, and so um, if you have a lot of these, they look like moguls on a ski hill. Um, and, and so if you have a lot of these and they're all facing the north or the, or the northwest, then, um, th then those probably went down in the hurricane. Because winds, you don't get southeast winds um, of, that, of that kind of strength. So another thing that you might see are trees that were bent like this. Um, so on the left is a softwood, it's a hemlock, and on the right is a hardwood. And they, um, they take different means for um, re regaining an upright position where a softwood will just sweep back to, to, um, to the sun. And uh, a hardwood tree will, um, you, you see the, the, the where the trunk, the continuation of where that trunk would have been going up like that. So that tree was bent like that. And then basically what happens is the top of the tree um, sloughs off, falls off, and a lower branch takes over as, as the leader. So, so that kind of boomerang shape is characteristic of, of hurricane trees. So here's a few more images of of that sort of thing. One of my favorite trees there. Just, I mean, that, the recovery that that tree made to, to keep wanting to live. So in the 85 years since the hurricane, the forest has recovered. And so the, the, the woods that, that I bought um, 35 years ago, um, continue to grow, and our forests are incredibly resilient. Um, 
trees. You know, I've got a tree in my woods that was that I've cored, and it was a tree from eight, 1832, and so it now is about a 30-inch diameter tree. But at the time of the hurricane, it was an 11-inch tree, and so when it tipped but didn't go down, all the trees around it went down. And the amount of sunlight that that tree got was the best thing that ever happened to it. So that hurricane w just made an incredible spurt of growth in all of the trees um, in the forest that were still standing. But along with the recovery, there's increased vulnerability. So right now, um, we have in Rhode Island, all throughout New England, we have a much more mature forest than than what was in place in 1938. And so if we were to have a hurricane of that stature to come through again, the damage would be much, much worse. Much, much worse. Um, and the, the bright side of that is that it would not come as a surprise. We're not gonna lose 600 people because we know that hurricanes are coming. They've gotten so good at, at describing tracks and and they don't necessarily always get it right about how um, how strong it's going to be but they're very good on, on where it's going to make landfall but um, it, it, so if we get a replay of 38 you're going to see so many so many trees down and there's so much more infrastructure than there was in 38 um, just think of all of the power lines and, and cable and telephone lines all of them along roads, all of them with trees towering above, above them. So if, if and when it happens, it's going to be serious. And another reason to really be concerned is that we have twice as many people in New England as we had in 1938. And so all of that tremendous damage happened to uh, the combined Long Island and New England that had nine million people, and now there's 18 million in that same footprint. And so it's, um, there's a, a lot more infrastructure, a lot more people gonna um, have trouble. And so, you know, it could be another 85 years, it could be next week. It's, it's a natural event and it doesn't, it's very unpredictable out, uh, you know, more than a couple weeks. And so we have no idea if and when it will happen, but um, I am hoping that it doesn't happen anytime soon. And um, so that's, I, I'll, I'll end there and um, be happy to take any questions.